Hey, Hope City, thank you so much for joining us for our online Bible study. Y'all, it is week five of this teaching series called The Last Days, a study on the book of Revelation. And I want to encourage you, if you haven't watched parts one through four yet, or if you missed one of them, go back and check them out on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash hopecity262, or on our Facebook page, which is at our, O-U-R, our hope city and so i want to encourage you to share this right now with somebody maybe share it to your timeline on facebook or tag some people and if you haven't done so already would you consider subscribing to our youtube channel if you haven't done so already would you consider liking our facebook page both of those will help us continue to reach people with the hope-filled message of jesus so we have a central theme to this entire study and i'm going to say it again for the fifth time now and that is Jesus is coming back. The point of this entire series, uh, studying the book of Revelation, is that Jesus is coming back. And so we need to get ready, we need to stay ready, and we need to help others get ready. Jesus is coming back, so let's get ready, stay ready, and help others get ready. Hey y'all, we are in for um, some fun today in this lesson because we are tackling a tough topic, which is the anti-Christ. Somebody say, uh-oh, in the chat. Now, I wanna give you this disclaimer up front. I am not claiming to be an expert in this line of study. In fact, I'm nowhere close. But I did do, I did do my very best to try to um, lean into this and see what the Bible says about it what other commentators have said about it, what theologians and scholars have said about the Antichrist. But I want to encourage you to study this on your own. If this interests you, maybe this piques your interest tonight or today, that you would go you know, study this on your own. I think it's important to note that the Bible has a lot to say about the Antichrist. There's about a hundred passages about the Antichrist, and there's about 25 different variations of the Antichrist's name, and or title. And so let's jump in right away in 1 John 2, 18 and 22, where it says, Dear children, this is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. So the Antichrist is coming, and even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. Verse 22. Who is the liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a person is the Antichrist, denying the Father and the Son. So interesting, these verses, because it basically says the Antichrist is coming and the spirit of the Antichrist has already come. Catch this now. There is a future Antichrist but there is also a present spirit of the Antichrist. So that's how I want to break down our lesson and our time together, is that at first we're going to look at the Antichrist, which is yet to come. And then we will conclude our time together by looking at the spirit of the Antichrist that is already in the earth and has been for some time. So let's first start by looking at the future Antichrist. To best understand the future Antichrist, we need to look at where he fits in correlation with the hierarchy of evil according to the Bible. You see, as Christians, we believe in one God, the true God, the living God. And we also believe that he is a triune God. So this kingdom of God or the kingdom of light has God the Father. And there's also obviously God the Son, which is of course Jesus. And then there's God, the Holy Spirit, but it's one God. This is one God. And the kingdom of darkness always tries to mimic and pervert what the kingdom of God is and does. And so we believe in a triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the kingdom of darkness tries to mimic this and pervert it. So it also tries or has tried to set up its own triune God. Catch this now. There is, first of all, Satan. This is the devil. Revelation calls him the great dragon or the ancient serpent. 
then there is the Antichrist. Okay? This is the first beast mentioned in Revelation 13. Then there is the false prophet. This is the second beast mentioned in Revelation 13. And so you can see how we have, as Christians, as believers, we have you know, God the Father, God the Son, which is Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. And the kingdom of darkness tries to mimic that and pervert it by having Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. Both beasts, the Antichrist, which is the first beast, and the false prophet, which is the second beast in Revelation 13, both beasts are can be found in Revelation chapters 12 through 14. Um, a lot of it, you know, is found in Revelation 13. It is the false prophet's job to point people towards the Antichrist. Once again, this is a perverted attempt at copying how the Holy Spirit points people to Jesus. The false prophet and the Antichrist work together. Revelation 13 calls them both beasts, and Revelation 19 tells us that they're so closely linked together that they will share the same fate. Revelation 19.20 says, And the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet, who did mighty miracles on behalf of the beast, miracles that deceived all who had accepted the mark of the beast and worshipped his statue. Both the beast and the false prophet, both the beast and his false prophet, were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. So what does the Bible say about this future Antichrist? I have six points and I want you to write them down and I think they're going to help you process and think through this future Antichrist. Once again, there is a future Antichrist like an actual man that will rise up, a future Antichrist, which is to come. And then there is also a spirit of the Antichrist, which has already come. So we're talking about this future Antichrist. And there's, there's six points I want you to, to write them down. Number one, the future Antichrist is not just an enemy of Christ, but also a counterfeit of Christ. He's not just an enemy or an adversary of Christ, but he is, in fact, a counterfeit of Christ. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and we're going to look at verses 2 through 4 and 9 and 10, where it says, don't, e don't be so easily shaken or alarmed by those who say that the day of the Lord has already begun. Don't believe them. Even if they claim to have a spiritual vision, a revelation, or a letter supposedly from us, Verse 3, don't be fooled by what they say, for that day will not come until there is a great rebellion against God and the man of lawlessness. Here's one of those 25 titles. The man of lawlessness is revealed, the one who brings destruction. He will exalt himself and defy everything that people call God and every object of worship. He will even sit in the temple of God claiming that he himself is God. So right here, we even see how he's counterfeiting and acting, imposing like he is God. Verse nine, this man will come to do the work of Satan. So like Jesus came to do the work of God the Father, Jesus says, when you see me, you've seen the Father. He tells his mom when he gets lost in the temple at 12 years old, don't you know I had to be about my father's business, that he came on earth through the work and the will of the Father, in a counterfeited, perverted way, the Antichrist is come, will come to do the work of his Father, so to speak, which is Satan. So this man will come to do the work of Satan with, here it is, counterfeit power and signs and miracles. Verse 10, he will use every kind of evil deception to fool those on their way to destruction because they refuse to love and accept the truth that would save them. So anti-Christ literally means anti-Christ. Catch this. It means anti-Jesus. Anti-Christ means against Christ, but it also means, very powerful, when you get this revelation, it means against Christ, but it also means instead of Christ. 
So listen, the Antichrist is both an enemy to Jesus and a counterfeit of Jesus. He's not just against Christ, he's literally saying, I am the Christ. So he's, he's like, he hates Jesus, he hates Christ, but he also, in some weird twisted way, wants to be Jesus so bad. So he's anti-Christ, but he also wants people to worship him as if he is Christ. But he's anti-God, but he wants to be a God himself. So the Antichrist is not just an enemy, but it's also a counterfeit of Christ. The second thing I want you to know about the Antichrist, this future Antichrist, is that he will use deception to cause destruction. He will use deception to cause destruction. Verse 10 said, he will use every kind of evil deception to fool those on their way to destruction. 2 John 1, 7, I say this because many deceivers have gone out into the world. They deny that Jesus Christ came in a real body. Such a person is a deceiver and an antichrist. So this future antichrist will use deception. They will use this counterfeit, perverted version of what is holy. And they will use deception. They will try to deceive the world and will deceive many of the, of the world. That deception is one of the biggest tools of the Antichrist. That it, he can get a person deceived, even if it looks real, but just deceive them enough to, to think that that is actually Christ when it's actually the Antichrist. That is meaning he is successful in what he's trying to attempt to do that he uses deception that leads to destruction. And the, the text also uses this word lawlessness that is a characteristic of the future Antichrist. And that is also a characteristic of the present spirit of the Antichrist. But he will promote such an agenda of lawlessness that there will be no laws. It's just total chaos and, and anarchy. And the way he will use that is because as we'll learn in a little bit here, that he will need that chaos and craziness and anarchy so that he can seem as though he is the one who will provide global peace. So number one, he is not just an enemy of Christ, but he's also a counterfeit of Christ. Number two, this future antichrist will use deception to cause destruction. You guys are doing awesome. Come on, stick with me. I know this is heavy stuff, but let's, let's keep learning together. Number three, this future antichrist will be prideful, political, and powerful. Prideful, political, and powerful. The future Antichrist seems to arise from a coalition of political rulers and will be a very charismatic speaker. Revelation 13, 1 and 2. Then I saw a beast rising up out of the sea. Very important. It had seven heads and ten horns, with ten crowns on its horns. And written on each head were names that blasphemed God. This beast looked like a leopard, but it had the feet of a bear and the mouth of a lion. And the dragon, so that's Satan, gave the beast, this is the Antichrist, his own power, throne, and great authority. This rose up out of the sea, which is important, because Daniel 7 speaks of the same type of thing. So Daniel 7 is in the Old Testament, but it has a lot to say about the end times and the Antichrist. So Daniel 7, um, let's do verses 2 through 3, verse 7, and verses 23 and 24. So verse 2 in Daniel 7, In my vision that night, I, Daniel, saw a great storm churning the surface of, here it is again, a great sea, with strong winds blowing from every direction. Then four huge beasts came up out of the water, each different from the others. Verse 7. Then in my vision that night, I saw the fourth beast, terrifying, dreadful, and very strong. It devoured and crushed its victims with huge iron teeth and trampled their remains beneath its feet. It was different from any of the other beasts, and it had ten horns. So we see... In Revelation 13, the beast coming out of the sea with ten horns. In Daniel 7, we see the beast coming out of the sea 
with ten horns. Verse 23, then he said to me, this fourth beast is the fourth world power that will rule the earth. It will be different from all the others. It will devour the whole world, trampling and crushing everything in its path, which is the desire of the Antichrist. 24, its ten horns are ten kings who will rule that empire. Then another king will arise, different from the other ten, who will subdue three of them. So the Antichrist is both prideful and political, and he's actually going to be very powerful. So he's prideful, political, and powerful. The fourth thing I want you to know about this future Antichrist is that he will promise peace, but will bring nothing but problems. He will promise peace, but bring nothing but problems. He will make a seven-year peace treaty with the nation of Israel, but will break his promise in the middle of that seven years. Daniel 9, 27 says, the ruler will make a treaty with the people for a period of one set of seven. But after half this time, he will put an end to the sacrifices and offerings. And as a climax to all his terrible deeds, he will set up a sacrilegious object that causes desecration until the fate decreed for this defiler is finally poured out on him. So, like I said before, this, this future Antichrist uses deception to cause destruction, and he is a proponent of anarchy and chaos and just everything out of control. Why? So that he can be this, what seems to be, once again, it's deception, but he can, he can make himself be this, this agent of peace, that he can make a peace treaty, that he can calm everything down, but it's, it's a hidden agenda in there. It's not because he really wants peace, and we're going to get to that here in a second. So he, he promotes peace, but he actually only brings problems. The fifth thing I want you to know about the future Antichrist is that he is after your worship. He is after my worship. He, he is after the worship of the people who are alive. Revelation 13, 12, and 14 through 15 says he required all the earth and its people to worship the first beast. So this is speaking of the second beast, which is the false prophet, whose job is really like to be the hype man for the Antichrist. He's the worship leader. He's trying to get everybody to worship the first beast, which in Revelation 13 is the Antichrist. So he required all the people of the earth to worship the first beast, he ordered the people to make a great statue of the first beast, which is the Antichrist. Verse 15, he was then permitted to give life to this statue so it could speak. So the statue of the Antichrist speaks, and look at what it says. Then the statue of the beast commanded that anyone refusing to worship it must die. This kind of sounds familiar, right? Like Nebuchadnezzar and golden statue, right? So he is after our worship. The Antichrist, the future Antichrist, is after our worship. It's the whole reason, y'all, why Satan, uh, which was called Lucifer at that time, got kicked out of heaven in the beginning because he wanted worship. He was jealous that God was receiving all the praise and all the worship, and he wanted to be on that same level as God. And he wanted praise and he wanted worship. And so God kicks him out. And, and ever since then, he has been after worship. He's been after being feeling worthy of, of attention. And he wants people to be in awe of him. And so he obviously puts this desire even in this perverted, counterfeit version of Jesus. Like Jesus comes to the earth to do the will of the Father, God. Likewise, the Antichrist will come on this earth, this future Antichrist, to do the will of his father, which is Satan. And just like Satan, just like Lucifer back in, in the beginning, um, not the very beginning, but back in time, he desires our worship. Listen to me. The future Antichrist will want people to worship him. He wants to be God. He's not just against God. He thinks he is God. And so he desires, he will desire 
for the whole world to worship him as if he's God. So he's after our worship, which is why you gotta be very important and very careful about who you worship and what, what kind of music you listen to. I know I'm sounding like the old time preacher, but the older I get, the more I see that, that like worship and music and what you give your attention to and your all to and your eyes to and your focus to is very important. And so you have to be careful about what you're giving your worship to, okay? Lastly, the sixth thing I want you to know about this future Antichrist is that he will set up and enforce a one world currency and a one world government. You might even use the word or term one world order. He will set up, a, set up and enforce one world currency and one world order. Revelation 13, 16 through 18. He required everyone small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to be given a mark on the right hand or on the forehead. And no one could buy or sell anything without that mark, which was either the name of the beast or the number representing his name. Wisdom is needed here. Let the one with understanding solve the meaning of the number of the beast, for it's the number of man. His number is 666. So, this Antichrist, this future Antichrist, and the false prophet working with him, as we've already discussed, their desire is to set up a one world government and a one world currency. So now, you know, in America, we have dollars. In Mexico, they have pesos. In other parts of the world, they have, you know, there's the, the British pound, and there's different, you know, different types of currency around the world. And in Europe, we see, you know, they're starting not starting for a while now, they've had the Euro. And so anywhere in Europe, you can use the Euro. But in this time of the future Antichrist, there will simply be one currency, and that will be the mark of the beast. That if you want to buy or sell anything, you will have to have this mark, that without it, you cannot buy or sell. Everyone at that time, the desire of the Antichrist and um, this, this false prophet is to create a one world currency and a one world government, a, a globalization. And I think that's why you see um, so many believers stand up and be against what we perceive to be happening in our world today, that there is a globalization, that there is a push for it to become one big government instead of many nations. Even when you think about technology and how, how closely linked the world is now, um, that we can, we can you know, through our social media, and I'm not saying that's a part of, of the Antichrist at all, but I'm just saying um, where we are now in history compared to 10 years ago, 20 year, years ago, I mean, dear Lord, 50 years ago, to where we are now, um, there has been an acceleration towards at least the possibility of a one world currency and a one world government. And so that is the future Antichrist. That the future Antichrist is not just an enemy of Christ, but he's a counterfeit of Christ. That he will use deception to cause destruction. He will be prideful, political, and powerful. He will promise peace, but only bring problems. He is after our worship. And lastly, he will set up and enforce a one world currency and a one world order. So that is the future Antichrist, this Antichrist that is yet to come. But there is, the Bible tells us, we read it, there is already in the earth a present spirit of the Antichrist. So remember, the Antichrist is coming, but the spirit of the Antichrist has already come. 1 John 2.18 says, Dear children, this is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, here it is, even now, many antichrists have come. 1 John 4, 3. But if someone claims to be a prophet and does not acknowledge the truth about Jesus, that person is not from God. Such a person has the spirit of the antichrist, which you have heard is coming to the world and indeed is already here. Okay? It's already here. This is John, the beloved. This is John who is a apostle, who is a disciple of Jesus, and, and he's saying when he writes that the spirit of the Antichrist is already here. So 
since the days of Jesus, there, there has been evidence that the spirit of the Antichrist was already in the earth. The spirit of the Antichrist is an enemy and a counterfeit of the Spirit of God or the Holy Spirit. The Antichrist spirit is not coming in the future. No, the spirit of the Antichrist is present even right now. It's a spirit that opposes the truth of Jesus and denies God the Father and Jesus as the Son. I believe there is a passage of scripture that provides great insight to what the spirit of the Antichrist will include. So this is not an exhaustive list, but I believe it is a good starting point for what the spirit of the Antichrist will include. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. You know this, you should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. Okay, listen to this list of characteristics of the last days and tell me or think to yourself if you think any of these are prevalent in the earth or society today verse 2 people will love only themselves and their money they will be boastful okay, like the antichrist was was prideful the spirit of the antichrist is boastful and proud scoffing at god disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. Does this sound familiar? They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than loving God. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. So these characteristics of, of the spirit of the Antichrist, according to 2 Timothy, is selfishness, greed, pride, rebellion, ungratefulness, disobedience, being sacrilegious, a lying spirit, having no self-control, hating what is good and loving what is evil. Come on, do we see this in 2020? Being hateful, do we see this in 2020? Being backstabbing, uh, lawless, reckless, loving pleasure, and loving empty religion, having a, a form of godliness but denying its power. Man, I, I think we see that like this whole list playing out in front of us that we are in fact in the last days. Now I know that's a relevant term as we have been discussing in this entire teaching series, but, but we see all of these happening in our society. That there is a push for, for lawlessness, that, that the spear of anarchy, if you, if you and I just open our eyes and, and lay down our political agendas for a second, we will see there is this, this push for a spirit of anarchy and lawlessness and, and people just doing whatever they want. That we see pride and we see um, empty religion of people having a, a, a form of godliness but denying his power that will go to church. And not you and I, but you know, we know people who go to church and they check it off their to-do list, but, but they don't have a true relationship with Jesus. It's empty religion. And they claim to be believers and yet they're hateful. They don't love their neighbor. They hate their neighbor. And, and you know, people disobedient to God's word, disobedient to their parents. We have problems with authority, um, ungratefulness. Go down the list. I mean, like literally it's like, yes, 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 yes. I see it. I see it. I see it. I see it. And I'm sure I've been guilty of some of these characteristics just like you. None of us are exempt, but we need to be aware of this spirit of the Antichrist. So we need to be aware, and we I'm going to talk about some things we need to do here, so I don't want to get too ahead of myself. But doesn't this sound like our society? That the spirit of the Antichrist is present in the church. It's present in our cities. It's present at our places of employment. It's present in America. That it's been present in the earth since the time of Jesus. That that John says, it's already here now. The Antichrist, the future Antichrist is coming, 
but the spirit of the Antichrist is present now. So what can we do? I want to give you five things, all right? Five is the number of grace. I didn't do that on purpose. And six was the number of man. So I don't know if you noticed, I did that on purpose. Um, and I think it just worked out that way. But there are six things I want you to know about the future Antichrist. And there's five things I think we can do when it comes to dealing with and, and battling against the spirit of the Antichrist. Come on, write this down. We're almost done. I know this is a heavy night. I don't know what this was. We're almost, we're almost done with this, this heavy topic. But I think it's very important that we're all on the same page. Here it is. What can we do? Number one, more discernment, less deception. More discernment, less deception. We already talked about how the Antichrist will use deception. And the, even the spirit of the Antichrist. The Bible says in the last days there will be many false prophets, false teachings, um, weird you know, winds of doctrine, and, and people just you know, coming up with random scriptures to support something that even though that has nothing to do with the context or the meaning, original intent of the scripture, that people you know, will just, just do what they want. With, with scripture and, and pick and choose, and, right? So we need, that's deception. We need discernment. We need to ask the Holy Spirit to give us eyes that can see beyond the natural, that we can have discernment, that, that we can, by the power of the Holy Spirit, not our own power, but by the, the power that lives in us, the Holy Spirit can give us discernment. That means, come on Hope City, that means that even when we can't see it with our natural eyes, that our spiritual eyes say, wait a minute, wait a minute, leave that person, don't, don't talk to that person anymore, or don't take that way home, or don't let your kid sleep over at that house, or whatever those, those we call it gut instincts, but it's really, as Christ followers, it's discernment. It's the power of the Holy Spirit speaking to us through that still small voice, and we will uh, overcome this, this desire of the Antichrist, the spirit of the Antichrist, to deceive us, by having discernment. That means what other people fall for or trip up on, we don't have to. Because, once again, not our own power. We're, we're not good like that. We're not God like that. But the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us can rise up in such a way where it will literally let the scales fall off of the eyes of our, of our heart and our mind. And we will be able to, by the power of the Holy Spirit, have discernment and be able to recognize the agenda of the enemy. Come on, that's good stuff. So we need more discernment, less deception. Number two, are you ready? Number two, we need to be more biblically correct and less politically correct. Uh-oh, easy, Pastor Tyler. More biblically correct and less politically correct. Listen, Hope City, I, I just want to be biblically correct. I want to be loving, I want to be gracious, but I also want to stand on truth. You know that one day you and I will have to give an account to God and only God. I, I will not have to give an account to you. I love you. I'm so happy you're watching this if you made it this far, but I won't have to give an account to you. You do not sit on the throne. You do not, you will not have a, a white throne judgment moment with Tyler Butler, but he will. And I think so many Christians, even pastors, even religious leaders have gotten to the point where we want to be so likable, likable. We want, to, we want to be so politically correct. We don't want to offend anybody. We don't want to get in trouble. We, and, and so what we've done is we've watered down, we being the church at large, we've watered down the truth for the sake of being politically correct. And the Bible, y'all, is true. It's, it's the infallible Word of God, it is 100% true. And so if the Bible says it, that's where we're going to stand on. If the Bible says it, that's where we're going to stand on. You can take any issue. We're not going to single any out tonight. But that's what we're going to stand on. In love, right? Not hateful, not self-righteous, not we're better than, but we are different than. Come on. We are not better than anybody. We are different. The Bible says we're called out. We are the ecclesia. We're Come ye out, be separated from the world. That we're a peculiar people, right? So we are, we are called to be different. We're not better than anyone else, but with God, we should become a better version of ourselves. And so I don't want to be so politically correct that we have to walk on eggshells. I mean, we can't say, well, no, I'm going to stand on, Hope City's going to stand on what the Bible says to be true. And when we, if we have tough conversations or, or have, you know, those, those tough moments, 
we will always do it with love and with grace and with humility, but you better believe we are gonna stand on what the Bible says to be true. That I believe, and I'm calling you to be more biblically correct and less politically correct. Y'all, if I'm gonna offend anybody, I'm gonna offend a person rather than offending God. Here's how I want you to think about it. You're gonna offend somebody and you're gonna please somebody. So do you wanna please God or do you wanna please people? Do you wanna offend God or do you wanna offend people? And the older I get, maybe I'm just getting more bold or, or I don't know, maybe a touch of, of recklessness, I'm not sure. Uh, but I wanna, I wanna please God. And if that means people are mad, then you know that's, that's on them, to be honest. If I've done everything right in love and humility and grace, but, but we're going to stand on truth. And if I want to offend anybody, I want to offend a person rather than offending God. I don't want to get to the, to the judgment day and, and God is mad because I was more politically correct than I was biblically correct. Come on, you got it. So more discernment, less deception. More biblically correct, less politically correct. Number three, write this down. More facts, less feelings. So I think so many Christians dealing with the spirit of the Antichrist and just trying to live out our daily walk with the Lord, we, we live so much on our emotions. I feel like it, I don't feel like it. I feel like worshiping, I don't feel like worshiping. I feel like God's worthy, I don't feel like God's worthy. And we, we get we get all in our feelings when that has nothing to do with it. That we need to stand on the truth, the facts, the word. That we need to, to be aware of what's really happening. Now, I feel like, no. What does the Bible say? What is the Holy Spirit inside of you saying? More facts, less feelings. Number four, more faith, less fear. More faith, less fear. So don't allow this, even this, this topic today, this lesson about the Antichrist, the end days, and some of you are so fearful. Listen, if you are in right standing with God, if you have a personal relationship with Jesus, if you've invited him into your life to be your Lord and Savior, if you've repented of your sins, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you have nothing to be fearful of. That's why I keep saying through this entire series, hey, Jesus is coming back. Get ready, stay ready, help others get ready. Because at the end of the day, we can get so lost in the content that we miss the, the, the point of the whole message, which is just get right with Jesus. So we have nothing to be fearful of. Hear me. You have not, if, you're, if you're in right standing with Jesus, if you've accepted him, all those things I just said, as, as your Lord and Savior, you have nothing to be fearful of. We should be aware. We shouldn't be ignorant. But we need more faith, less fear. This topic about the Antichrist and the spirit of the Antichrist, that should, that should make our faith rise up, not our fear rise up. The Bible says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear. Okay, So fear is not of God. Fear is from the Antichrist. Fear is the spirit of the Antichrist that wants you to bow down in fear and worship him. But we should not have the fear of the Antichrist. Come on, somebody. We should live with the fear of the Lord. That word fear does not mean afraid. It, it means in awe of. Once again, it's, it's worshiping. So we should have fear of the Lord. So more faith, less fear. And lastly, simply more focus on Jesus and less focus on ourselves. More focus on Jesus and less focus on us. That this entire series and, and really our entire life should be focusing on Jesus. Focusing on Jesus. And so if you're not careful, you, you, will, you will have a tendency, I will have a tendency to, to try to do this deep dive into what does every single little thing in, in Revelation mean and all the allegory and all the metaphors and, and all these word, you know, graphic images and pictures and and, and if you're not careful, it's like we'll try to, what the Bible says is the mystery, right? Then we'll try to, we'll try to figure it all out when really, really, I'm not saying don't do that, but at the end of the day, y'all, it's about Jesus. It's about understanding who you are in Christ. It's about knowing that we need to get ready, stay ready, and help others get ready. Why? Because Jesus is coming back. More discernment, less deception. More biblically correct, less politically correct. More facts, less feelings. More faith, less fear. And more focus on Jesus and less focus on us.
I hope this encouraged you today. I hope this made sense for you. I hope this brought some clarity in the topic area that can be so complex. If you have any questions, make sure to write them in the chat. And we'll try to reach out individually and answer those questions. And there's be some questions we just don't know because I'm not an expert, like I said. I wanna encourage you, if this interests you, do, do some study and some research on your own. And in everything you do, do not try to gain wisdom for wisdom's sake or revelation for revelation's sake, but do it so that you can fall more in love with Jesus, so that you can get ready, stay ready, and help others get ready. Hey, that's the lesson. Next week, I'm gonna be talking about the rapture. And I think next week might be the last week of this series. We'll see. I'm going to be talking about the rapture. When is the church getting raptured? When is Jesus coming back? All of that I will discuss next week. Hope City, I love you so much. Thank you for going on this journey with us, both in this lesson and this entire teaching series. Once again, share this with somebody, tag somebody, subscribe to our YouTube channel, like our Facebook page. Also, can I do this? I started my own uh, Facebook page. It's a it's a, my personal ministry. You can find it at Simply Writing In on Facebook. Tyler Butler, T Y L R E, kind of like Brett Favre, R E instead of E R. No strange. T Y L R E Butler, B U T L E R. And like my page on Facebook as well if you don't mind doing that. Otherwise, share this with somebody. I'll see you next week for part six of the last days. I love you. God bless.